Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to uh, Chiang Kai-shek plays it like Stalin between two wars 1926 part three of three by time ghost history. If you want to check out my previous reactions, remember the playlist card will be at the top. Just click on it and be able to access them. Okay, let's start. Three, two, one, go. During a few days, at the end of March 1926, a series of very confused and unclear events suddenly carry Chiang Kai-shek to the top of the Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, and paves the way for him to unite China in a way unseen since before the First World War. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. When we left China in our second 1925 episode, Sun Yat-sen, the father of the Chinese Republic, had just died, leaving a divided Kuomintang already split into left and right factions, but also in a union with the CPC, the Communist Party of China. This somewhat unorthodox alliance was born from the necessity for foreign support to be able to wage a war against the warlords of the North to unite China under Kuomintang control. You see, the only major international power willing to provide arms and finances for Sun Yat-sen's proposed northern expedition to defeat these warlords vying for control over the Beiyang government was the USSR. The Soviets hoped to twist the quote. I wonder, is the self-proclaimed emperor in Beijing still there? I wonder about that. I know that there's still warlords in the north, right? But um, the one that uh, orchestrated the coup against the uh, sitting emperor and um, he became the de facto president. He was chosen by the generals to become the president of the country, even though no one voted him in. Like, there was no due process. They just... Uh, you know, placed that authority on this man and then he proclaimed himself to be the next emperor of, of China. So yeah, I, I wonder if that guy is still there or um, has he been overthrown already? Kuomintang, left flank closer to the communists, push aside the right flank. The ultimate goal is a united China that would join the socialist international, considerably strengthening both the economic and military power of the communist movement. Well, this idea hinges on that the factions of the Kuomintang and the CPC play nice with each other. A plan with a fairly high risk of failure. And expectedly, as soon as Sun Yat-sen dies, the party starts falling apart, thereby also threatening the United Front. With Sun gone, the party's leadership is in the hands of three very different men, Wang Jingwei, Sun's closest collaborator and leader of the left faction of the party, Hu Hanmin, on the far right wing of the party, also a close advisor to Sun, but an advocate of a much more unilateral conservative party than Sun had envisioned. Between the two is the US-born pragmatist and moderate finance minister Liao Zhongkai, a strong believer in Sun's legacy and the architect of the communist alliance and cooperation with the Soviets. While the three party leaders continue to officially work together, ostensibly still preparing for the northern expedition, lesser leaders of the party fight petty regional wars with each other and independent warlords to increase their regional control within the southern half of China that they are trying to govern. It is a situation of more or less constant war that has to end to enable the northern expedition. And Chiang Kai-shek is building a new army through the Soviet-financed Wampol Military Academy. And the communists are just, you know, sitting on the fence, waiting for these three leaders to finish their little petty war of ideology. And then maybe by miracle chance, they can join forces to fight against the warlords in the north. Man, this is just so complicated. But the goal of uniting these warring factions or to defeat the ones that just won't fall in line. In April... Only weeks after her son's death, the Wampo force is transformed into the official Kuomintang party army with home base in Guangzhou, capital of the Guangdong province. Both the city and the province are known at the time in English as Canton. 
Despite initially having only 3,000 men, Chiang fights successfully in a series of campaigns and defensive battles against the regional warlords. By the end of 1925, he is firmly in control of Guangdong. On the way, he has captured at least 28,600 rifles, 220 machine guns, 30 artillery pieces, 6 gunboats, and more than 10 million cartridges. He's also rolled up new recruits and pressed some of the warlords into alliances with his army. He is now a force with which to be reckoned, and suddenly the prospect of a northern expedition looks more realistic. This is welcome news, especially to the Soviets, who have seen their other ally in China falter. They are the recently formed Kuomintun, the National People's Army in the Northwest, a warlord faction formed by Feng Yusheng, a Christian socialist, nationalist, and distinctly elusive figure in Chinese history. A Christian socialist nationalist. Wow. Hey, okay, you know, wear all the hats. Wear all the hats to, you know, conform to uh, what people might expect you to become, you know, as a leader, I guess. Oh. To everyone's surprise, in October 1924, roughly a year ago, Feng catapulted himself onto the national stage by suddenly mounting a coup, seizing control of the capital Beijing and ousting the Xili from power. His reasons for doing so are still unclear and range from possibly dissatisfaction with Xili leadership to uh, a bribe by the Japanese or promises of Soviet support. So the self-proclaimed emperor has been booted out by one of his own confidants. Ah, uh, okay. But regardless, this left him in control of the capital and shattered what legitimacy the Beiyang government retained. Unfortunately for Feng, this also left him isolated and under siege by forces from the Feng Xian clique into October 1925, who, by the way, are not related to Feng, despite the name. Nonetheless, the Soviets see a prospect for uniting the Kuomintang and the Kuomintang to gain control of all of the country. But to do that, the Kuomintang needs to be unified behind that plan. And in the summer of 1925, that is anything but a done deal. The right faction under Hu has now started to actively oppose continued cooperation with the communists and the USSR. Wang and Liao are still on board though, and Hu cannot overcome both of them at the same time. On August 20th, the party executive committee is to convene in Guangzhou. When Liao arrives for the meeting and steps out of his limousine, he is riddled with bullets from a group of five men armed with Mauser C-96 semi-automatic pistols, killing him instantly. That should pave the way for who, but it seems that he has overestimated his power and support base. As the obvious suspect, who is promptly removed from power and arrested. So now Wang, as party chairman, looks like he could finally gain unilateral control. His position is, in theory, strengthened after reforms introduced by the Soviet advisors to install a more regimented control over the growing army through the MAC, the Military Affairs Council, which has also just lost half of its members, leaving Wang dominant there too. Confusing? Yes. However, the party army, by now renamed the NRA, the National Revolutionary Army, is under operative control of Chang, who has already surged to de facto leader of the forces fused from four different warlord factions and now counting over 50,000 men, 10,000 of whom are under Chang's direct command, right? During the spring and summer, together with the Red Army advisors, Chang has allied himself with Wang, Liao, and Hu to use the power of the MAC to decrease the power of the other warlords. They have introduced much needed reforms to streamline command, reorganize the divisional structures and retrain the forces in the most recent battle doctrines of the Red Army forged during their massive and bloody wars of recent years. Most importantly, Chang has been at the vanguard of financing efforts to make sure that the army is paid, loyal, well-equipped for war. He has meticulously gone through the potential income sources of the party, eradicated middlemen in trade, and taken control of any potential income sources. The party now controls taxation, foreign trade tariffs, it runs extortion schemes, provides paid security for local businesses, and has a series of its own business ventures generating immediate income, out of which... 
Okay, so not only are they the government, but they are business and they are criminal signa- uh, syndicates and they are uh, bankers. They are all the functions of an economy and the governance of an economy, all in one. That's crazy. The most lucrative is their monopoly on the opium trade in southern China. Chang has made sure that the spoils of these efforts go mostly to the NRA, on the way further cementing his own position as its leader. So, although Wang is now at the top of the party on paper, in reality, he will have to share power with Chang. For the Soviets, who at the time feel they are working well with Chang, this situation seems to herald success for their plan. To me, it seems like all the Soviets wanted to look like Stalin. I mean, that guy looks like Stalin. If you, you know, didn't really focus on him, you just see that big mustache and then you'd be like, oh, isn't that Stalin right there? <laughs> I think it was in fashion to look like him in Russia. Wow. To appropriate the Kuomintang into the Socialist International. They all now get busy with setting the plans in motion to finally go to war in the North. Now, Chang's relationship with the Soviets is a bit difficult to understand, considering his position on the right flank of the party. Whether or not it is a deceit to gain the advantages of their support, or if he is truly convinced that the alliance makes sense is hard to discern. Whichever the case, Chang repeatedly comes under attack from the rest of the right wing during 1925 for being too cozy with the Russians. And Chang does seem loyal to the Soviets at times, even speaking like a fellow traveler in communism. At a celebration over yet another victory over a dissenting warlord, he says, the Chinese revolution would fail if it did not unite with all the revolutionaries of the world. When insurrection threatened by a group inside the executive committee calling themselves the Western Hills Group, he writes in a letter that the failure of the revolution thus far is to blame on the, quote, arrogance and corrosive jealousy as demonstrated by this group. In January 1926, his alliance with the extreme left pays off. At the Kuomintang Annual Assembly, the CPC represents one-third of the votes, and these votes carry Chang to an official position on the executive committee. However, the same month, the Soviet advisors suddenly seem less convinced of how handleable Chang really is. Now, remember, Stalin and Trotsky's ultimate goal is the appropriation of the Kuomintang to create a communist sister state in the East. Whether he knows this or not, Chang has enjoyed a close and effective relationship with the head of his Red Army advisors, Vasily Blucher. But Vasily is replaced in November 1925 by Nikolai Kuibyshev, a veteran of the Civil War and senior of the Red Army academies. In January, Kuibyshev reports back to Stalin that it is not yet possible to obtain complete control of the Revolutionary Army. Other advisors describe Chang as conceited, reserved, and ambitious, but that he can be handled if he is praised in a delicate manner and dealt with on the basis of equality and never showing that one wants to usurp even a particle of his power. As the rift seems to increase, Kuibyshev shows open disdain for Chang and his commander, stating they seem completely ignorant of the arts of war. The same month, Chang writes of his Russian advisors, I treat them with sincerity and they reciprocate with deceit. Despite this rumbling, the preparations of war continue with increasing fervor. By now, endless convoys of Russian ships are delivering thousands of tons of arms, armaments, and equipment every month in preparation for a spring offensive. Where did all of these boats come from exactly? I mean, where did they set sail? Maybe, Maybe on Russia's eastern borders, you know, uh where they're bordering you know, the United States of America with Alaska, maybe there, that's where they were launching their ships, probably. Because Russia is a very big country. And, you know, I don't expect their shipments to come all the way from Europe, uh, from the, uh, from the what, what is it, the Baltic Seas, I think, coming all the way there, crossing over Africa, or maybe going through the Suez Canal, going all the way into um, the Indian Ocean and, coming all the way to China. I, I don't see that happening. So probably they went on the eastern side of their border. Okay. Yeah. It's crazy though. Meanwhile, 
the anti-communist Western Hill Group continues sowing discord. They float rumors of a coup by the CPC involving Wang and the Russians to oust Chang. If this is true or not remains contentious, but Chang bites, and by February he is despondently writing, I feel like I'm single-handedly fighting tigers from the front and wolves from the back. Political life is hell. In March 1926, things escalate quickly when it looks like this rumored coup is about to take place. One day they're your friends, the next they're your enemies, and then they're your friends again. Yeah, that's politics for you. Now, to this day, in 2019, it remains unclear if what happens is in fact meant to be a coup orchestrated by the Russians, an independent operation by the CPC, a fake by Chang to give him an excuse to seize power, or simply just a series of misunderstandings. But whichever the case, during the night of the 18th and 19th of March, the most powerful gunship of the NRA Navy, the SS Zhongshan, suddenly leaves the port of Guangzhou and anchors off a nearby island. Chang later claims that this alarmed him as the commander claimed to have acted on his orders. Orders Chang says he never issued. His fears are compounded by a barrage of strange phone calls that reportedly happened on the 18th, with, among others, Wang's wife calling five times to Chang's office to inquire about his planned whereabouts for the next few days. More reports of confused calls emerge, and Chang becomes convinced that it's a plot to either kidnap him and ship him off to Vladivostok, or even murder him. His, reportedly, first reaction is to run, and he books passage on a steamer to Japan, but changes his mind at the last moment. Instead, he declares martial law, cuts off the phone network for all of Guangzhou, and orders his cadets and NRA forces to arrest all political officers of the CPC. He places the Soviet advisors and Wang under house arrest. Now, Wang was in bed with a cold and a high fever, and when confronted with this situation, he is indignant and waves it off as paranoid overreaction by Chang. On the 22nd, the executive committee convenes at Wang's house. Wang continues to claim innocence, and in a compromise, it's agreed that Wang will soon take a prolonged vacation abroad. After Wang and his family depart for Europe on April 7th, Chang starts cleaning out communist influence in the party and NRA by removing large sections of the CPC leadership from the party's committees, forcing out their representatives at the Wampo Academy, and demanding that several of the Soviet advisors, including Kuibyshev, return to Russia. He also removes a few token right-wing activists from the party and never openly criticizes or disdains the United Front. Instead, he brushes it all away as a limited and individual matter of a small number of members of our party who had carried out an anti-revolutionary plot. Regardless of the situation, he still desperately needs his allies in Moscow, though, to even have a remote chance of defeating the warlords in the north. The NRA now counts some 85,000 men, but that's only a tenth of the joint forces he might face once he sets off on his offensive. So even if the NRA has superior training, more arms per soldier, they're generally better equipped, he needs allies to face off those numbers. But he can't count on Feng and the Guomindang if he doesn't have the Soviet Union at his side. So he sends a proposal for a new deal to Moscow. The CPC shall not hold any executive positions in the Kuomintang or in the NRA. Kuibyshev shall be sent back to Russia and only a limited amount of advisors be left behind. The political commissars in the NRA will be abolished. An extensive list of Chinese communists known to Moscow shall be handed to Chang. Arms and equipment deliveries shall continue as planned. And finally, the military advisory committee will be abolished and Chang recognized as the sole political and military leader of the Kuomintang and the NRA. Now, that shopping list might sound like an outrageous insult to the Soviets, and many take it that way, most notably Trotsky, who immediately opposes any deal. However, Stalin decides he will go along with it, overrules Trotsky, and approves all of Chang's demands, effectively and rather suddenly abandoning any hope to appropriate the NRA for Soviet interests. We shall never know exactly why. But 
Perhaps he thinks he'll get another chance, or he feels the threat of the warlords in Japan is the greater of two evils, or maybe he simply admires Chang for his balls of steel. Well, we can only speculate. I'm thinking maybe he, you know, probably had other important issues to deal with. He just didn't have the time or the resources to deal with what's going on with China. Because, you know, like it's it's unstable. You just don't know what's going to happen next uh, in terms of the common tang as well as the uh, the northern warlords and everything else that's going on in the political miasma of uh, southern China. So probably he's like, you know what, this experiment here has failed. Uh, let's move on and let's focus on other things and let the Chinese sort themselves out. And then um, if there is an opportunity for us to assist in a way then we will but right now we're stepping back i think maybe that's it so in the process of a year it could be construed that chiang kai-shek has gone from a right-wing communist sympathizer for the greater good of the nationalist party and the chinese revolution to a ruthless politician serving mainly his own interests and desire for power his detractors and proponents still argue that point to this day. We certainly cannot tell you what went on in his mind and in his heart in these 12 months. But we can tell you this is just the beginning of a very long, bloody, and incredibly destructive process to put back together the shards of China. When we return in 1927, Chang will have launched his northern expedition together with Wang, Feng, and Stalin. They will still be at each other's throats. Hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children will have lost their lives in the process, and China will still be broken, paving the way for yet more conflicts, invasions, and ultimately, the Far Eastern Front of World War II. If you'd like to see how Chiang Kai-shek launches another offensive many years later, click here for our World War II episode covering the Chinese Winter Offensives of 1939 and 1940. Our Time Ghost Army member for this episode is Charles Buckley. Do like Charles and support the war effort by joining us on Patreon or at timeghost.tv. Do not forget to subscribe and press the bell. And as anyone in China would say in 1926, no matter what, stay radical, keep up the revolution. <sighs> Okay, that was Chiang Kai-shek plays it like Stalin between two wars, 1926, part three of three by Time Ghost History. Yes, uh, the situation in China is still chaotic. It's still unstable. Uh, you know, the Kuomintang party, really, it's still shattered into pieces. You know, people having their own ambitions and ideologies and what do they want to push forward. But it seems like, yes, now there is one leader uh, in terms of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. He is now the leader of the Kuomintang Party and the southern regions of China. Um, but like um, Indy Nidal says that, you know, they will push forward into the north with uh, the Communist Party and the, uh, the Soviets, but they will still be at each other's throats. So nothing is assured, nothing is cemented. This is just an alliance of convenience. Once they've defeated the warlords in the north, they will be at each other's throats again, but even more um, deadlier than before. And, you know, there's going to be more chaos and more destruction. But, you know, this just shows you again, you know, the, the ambitions of, of, of leaders, you know. They just don't really care about the lives of the people that they are sending out to their deaths. They don't care about you know the potential future of their nations you know what they want is their dreams to come true no matter what and people like that really they're horrible they are horrible um, political assassinations uh, controlling not only the state but the economy and every facet of life you know of the people just to make sure that your funding is secure for your party. Just to make sure that your dreams and your aspirations of ruling China are secured. No matter how much uh, people must suffer, how much 
people must uh, sacrifice their own livelihoods. It doesn't matter. It's all for the good of this party that you want to lead uh, China. Um, but yeah, you know, these are the types of leaders that we've been having throughout all the years. Um, I think nowadays people are seeing through that kind of stuff, hopefully. But, you know, in terms of China right now, you know, they have their own um, dictator, if you can say that, you know, supreme leader, overlord. Um, so it's going to take a, some time before they can shake off this kind of uh, one man political hegemony. Um, and also in Russia, you know, during these times, it's also going to take time for Russia to also shake off their uh, dictator. But yeah, guys, um, that's it for today. Um, if you like the video, remember to give me a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you'll be updated with my latest videos. And I will see you next week Tuesday. Okay?